This video is to support your learning for uh, assignment 4.1, part of the research methods units and part of the sport and exercise science course. You can see that it's, it's quite broad in that it looks at ethical and legal issues in sports research or sports science research. Um, the benefit is for this particular assignment but also very important for 26.1, a different unit and will feed into your consideration in planning your own project that you follow on having completed the research methods unit. So we look at ethical and legal issues in research, we look at a few organisations, we look at the, the things you need to consider when you're preparing to do some research and we also look at the consequences of not perhaps following these guidelines and some of the things that can go wrong. Let me begin by looking um, some time ago. Uh, this, these images, quite unpleasant, sinister images, are of um, circumstances in World War II, where, as you know, several people were help, uh, held as prisoners in, in Nazi concentration camps. And unfortunately, the Nazis uh, used these prisoners to conduct experiments on. Um, this was clearly against their, their will and their choice, and they were given very little care or consideration. Uh, obviously, the opposite of what should be happening in any kind of research. The purpose of these experiments were to help the Nazis. In these examples, I think it was uh, to help understand different temperatures. So these poor people were submerged in different temperatures um, to see at what point they become unconscious and perhaps even to the point of death. And the image on the right is, I think, of um, somebody who was being used in an experiment to look at lack of oxygen at altitude. Both of these geared towards helping the German Luftwaffe, the pilots, if they had to bail out or if they were in certain circumstances. So clearly, these poor prisoners were subjected to a lot of harm, emotional and physical harm, to the point possibly of death. And that's, that's in part where the word subject comes from. These guys were subjected to it against their will. And we don't tend to use that term anymore for various reasons. So prior to 1947, as with those examples, there were no accepted codes of conduct or behavior in terms of using humans in experimentation, whatever the research was, which is, is as you saw, a pretty horrendous situation. However, after the Second World War finished and the Nuremberg trials were going on, where everybody looked very closely at what the Nazis had done to people and how they treated people, what emerged from that was initially called the Nuremberg Code. Um, and that, on the next slide, will show you uh, in detail 10 points which, um, as a researcher, you must consider and you must take very seriously if you intend to use human participants in any kind of study. Later than that, uh, the Declaration of Helsinki uh, came about, and that again is, a, is sort of another version, a modified version. This actually came about and was produced by the World Medical Association. So as a combination of those two changes, those two summits, we now have a very established set of ethical principles that we as researchers need to abide by. So you can pause the video, um, you need to make notes and summarise, obviously not word for word, but summarise the 10 points that have come out from the Nuremberg Code. You can see that key elements of it are uh, voluntary consent, somebody giving their uh, consent to take part, as opposed to those poor prisoners who were given no choice at all. But as I said, go through, make notes on those 10 elements. Now, I've mentioned this, this language, this, these words, ethical and legal, um, and I think it's stuff that probably we use in daily life but might not be able to define too succinctly. But let's see what we can come up with. So ethics tend to be moral principles, things that you should govern rules of life by, let alone rules of professional research. It's almost like the what's right and what's wrong of life. Um, and within those ethical principles, Certainly as a researcher, the intention and the expectation is that nobody involved in your research is going to come to any physical or emotional harm. Legal aspects are probably a bit more straightforward in a way in that this is what the law says, the civil law says, is right or wrong. So it's just not what, as a human, uh, you know, within humanity we think is right and wrong. It's also the legality, what you are allowed and what you are absolutely not allowed to do. And as a researcher, you need to consider both of these aspects. Now, this organisation, BASES, 
British Association of Sport and Exercise Sciences is absolutely critical as a researcher for lots of reasons. And what you will do at some point is you will need to go on to the BASES website and find the code of conduct because based on um, subject-specific guidance, so obviously sports science research, but also those Nuremberg and the Helsinki aspects of what's ethical and what's allowable, BASES has determined a code of conduct for researchers. So if you're going to conduct some research, you need to abide by those guidelines. Um, and if you don't, there are likely to be consequences. BASES is broader than that, though. It's also uh, the key organisation in sports science where a sports scientist could be accredited. Basically, you have to fulfil several criteria. Um, you have to have a certain you know, degree of competence, certain experience, certain qualification. And if you fulfill those criteria, you become an accredited BASES sports scientist. You might be a physiologist, a biomechanist. But to have that label of being BASES accredited is very good for your status and, you know, essentially your credibility, how people look at you, how trusted you should be as a researcher. And we'll look at that later. That is quite important. Now, going on to um, other important parts of process when you're doing research, but certainly an important factor is the ethics committee. Now, organisations or establishments such as universities might have an ethics committee. And this is a group of people who are independent of your particular study, who are all specialists in, in, area, in, your, in the area. They're very knowledgeable. Before you're able or should go and conduct any research, you have to complete a rather extensive project proposal form. And within that form, you have to state, you know, in a lot of detail who you intend to study, how you're going to go about it, how you're going to get the sample, what will be involved, what procedures you're going to conduct, um, what is the value and the merit of your study you know, what you intend to gain from conducting this study, what are the expenses, because the ethics committee need to weigh up whether they give you ethical clearance or not, and that basically means give you the thumbs up or not. They need to make sure that everybody involved in that study is protected, including you, but certainly including the participants. Um, so it's a very important part of this. They could give you clearance, in which case you can go ahead. They could refer you with minor amendments or major amendments, or they could say, absolutely no, this is not enough value, there's too much risk, it's unsafe, you can't go ahead. So an important step in, in uh, before you conduct your study. Now, let's get a little bit more uh, specific in terms of looking at the ethical and legal considerations that you'll need to be aware of. So, First step is that your participants must give informed consent. What this means is that they understand exactly what they're going to experience and why they're doing it, what the possible risks are, and they need to sign a document to say that they know this, they understand, and they're happy to go ahead. Also, they need to know that they have the right to withdraw, so that even if they do say, yep, yeah, I'm going to go ahead, if they change their mind within your study, they can stop participation, and that's all okay. They should be volunteers, they should be not coerced into taking part, they shouldn't be bribed into taking part or pressured into taking part. They are not subjects, they are participants willingly. With the information that they share with you um, or that come from your study, clearly it might be inappropriate for you to publicise this information, specifically giving personal information you know, to, to the public or, or shared with, without their permission. So it's really important that we abide by sort of the rule of confidentiality. You shouldn't use subjects, uh, sorry, participants' names. You might need to change their name or give them a number reference or some kind of identification. But you must be very respectful of the confidentiality and the potential sensitivity of some results. Clearly, if you're going to conduct a piece of research and possibly administer tests onto the participants, you need to be skilled and experienced and competent and know exactly what you're doing. That's pretty obvious. Similarly, you're responsible for the well-being of yourself and everybody participating in the study. And you should behave professionally. You shouldn't be, let's say, overly familiar with people. You shouldn't make you know, negative comments about people. You should be neutral. You don't want to be biased with any particular participants. All part of a very generic professional approach to your study. And what you are not allowed to do is to deceive your participants. You're not allowed to say, 
this is what the experiment will um, be about, this is what you'll do, and then do something totally different. Whether you forget to tell them something, whether you omit something, or whether you consciously lie, it's totally inappropriate. When you have participants who are willing to take part, you obviously need to do a sort of a health and a medical screening to make sure that they are suitable and not in an in a inappropriate position in that they have no conditions that would be harmful if they did take part in your study. That's a really important part of the screening process. And obviously, if it's relevant, you must not break any kind of law in, within your, your research. Um, pr again, pretty obvious. You have to ensure that everybody will be uh, safe. So it could be that you ensure they do a suitable warm up or cool down. It, sh it could be that you check equipment being used, that it's in good working order. Anything that you might do, you should do a risk assessment for any practical activities, all ensuring the health of your uh, and well-being of your participants. And as I said, linking in with the, eth uh, the ethics clearance and committee, you need to do a risk benefit analysis, really help weigh up I'm going to be putting some, you know, some my participants in some difficult situations, but it's absolutely worth it. The risk is not great. The benefit outweighs it sufficiently to warrant going ahead. And finally, scientific misconduct. If you're conducting an experiment, you should not be biased. You should not cheat in any way with results. You should not ignore results that don't say what you want them to say, particularly when you're writing up your results and doing your discussion. So that's kind of what you should consider. Um, but what we also need to understand is what are the consequences if you don't fulfill those criteria, you don't take them into consideration, what can go wrong? What are the consequences or implications of not working ethically and legally? So obviously for your participants, there could be physical harm or emotional harm. Um, there's no way anybody should leave with any kind of trauma. If your participants you know experienced something that was pretty tough a tough training session debrief them afterwards talk them through it ensure that when they are le when they leave the session or this experiment ends they are totally okay in terms of you as a researcher it could be that if there was any errors or issues within your your study you might be told by bases or that you need to have some ethical training to make sure that you anticipate things in future if you break the law that or harm somebody seriously, there could be prison sentences because essentially you're breaking the law. You might be reprimanded or suspended from your role as a researcher or your job. You might be fined significant amounts of money, if it's, particularly if you've caused, pers caused personal harm to somebody. You might lose your basis accreditation or your professional role and, and, and status. And as I said, basis accreditation can go. All quite harmful to you as a researcher. So we need to understand the consequences of not taking those ethical and legal issues seriously. Lastly then, this is a, a scenario that you might come across or you might have to talk about. Um, pause the video and have a quick read of this. See if you can pick out any things that you think seem wrong in terms of being ethical or legal. So here are some clues. The participant didn't know that it was maximal activity. They met, there was a degree of deception, whether it was intentional or not. Um, they struggled with the high intensity activity. They felt very unwell, distressed, uh, potentially emotional, physical harm. They asked to stop, but they weren't particularly allowed to stop. They have the right to withdraw. That's not okay. And also, ignoring a request to stop is not a professional way to treat your, you know, let alone a human way to treat uh, anybody around you. So from a simple example there, we can pick up quite a lot of things that were lacking in this study. And that's the sort of analysis and evaluation of a potential sports science situation you need to have for your assignment.